punished for entering the spirit world. A Dachira trip report by Agent 11421 posted to Earwood.org July 19th, 2005. I had heard a lot of reports about Dachira stramonium and I was anxious to try it. Knowing the dangerous effects of the plant, I decided to start out with some small doses. I first tried chewing four seeds, but after an hour, they seemed to have no effect. I then chewed another four seeds, but again, the same results, none. I decided to get braver, and the next night, I chewed twenty whole seeds. But after an hour, I felt nothing again. Now I was getting frustrated. I decided to try 40 whole seeds, but once again, I was disappointed with no effects. It was at this point, I just totally gave up on the seeds. I then tried smoking the leaves, and I smoked four Datura cigarettes one after the other, which again, had no effect whatsoever. I live alone and was unbothered by anybody. Being mindful of the dangers of Datura, I took no unnecessary chances. I waited until late evening about 7pm to try the dried leaves. I took a handful of them and boiled them in three cups of water for 30 minutes. The concoction I had made was very dark in colour and I strained the liquid in my strainer into a coffee mug. It smelled and tasted awful, so I decided to sweeten it with two tablespoons of honey and drank it down as quickly as possible. I was immensely surprised at how quickly the effects came on. Within 10 to 15 minutes, I began to get a feeling of being drunk. I knew that my best bet was to head straight for bed, where I felt I would be safest. My usual nightly custom was to bring a glass of water into my bedroom with me, but this night I was drunk by the Tchura. I lost my balance and fell against the wall, down to the floor and breaking the glass in the process. I returned to the kitchen sink and filled another glass of water, but again my legs gave way under me and I fell down like a drunkard. Once again, I filled a glass with water, but it somehow slipped out of my hands and crashed to the floor. By the time I finally made it to my bathroom, I'd broken five glasses, but I wasn't aware of it until the next morning when I saw the damage. Finally resting in my bed, I fell asleep quickly. I had an extremely vivid and realistic dream of this invisible being grabbing me, throwing me head first into a wall. Try as I might, I was unable to see it at all. Once again, he picked me up and slammed me head first into the wall. Then it began to beat me. It grabbed my forearm and snapped it in two. My bones were protruding from my flesh, and my blood was squirting high up into the air. I pleaded with the being to leave me alone, but it showed me no mercy whatsoever. It picked me up again and slammed me head first into the wall. And it was at that point, I woke up and realised I was dreaming. But I was nonetheless quite shaken by the whole ordeal. I had the strangest feeling that the being was punishing me for entering the spirit world. I wanted to teach me a lesson of some sort. I tried to sit up in bed, but I felt a very strong gravitational pull as I did do so. It was sort of like the force of gravity was making it difficult for me to sit up. This did not scare me, and I thought little of it. I looked around the room, and everything seemed to be normal. When suddenly, this powerful surge overcame me. I instantly made a cyborg with my hands and tossed it at the wall. This ended up tearing a large hole in the wall which worried me senseless, because I feared that my landlord would find out and evict me. It was right now that I laid down and went back to sleep. 
What I didn't realise at the time was that I was never awake at any time at all. All of this was a very vivid and clear dream. The next morning, I arose and went into my kitchen to prepare my morning coffee. As I sat at the kitchen table, a sight frightened me. It was my beloved house cat. She was laying on the floor still and lifeless, and her body was bloated. As I watched her lifeless body, my heart was deeply saddened. I could only conclude in that moment that she must have drunk some of the Datura brew from the pot on the stove, and died from it. Sadly, I sat at the kitchen table for an hour, when I noticed that my cat was changing shape. I approached closer, and found out that it wasn't even my black cat at all. It was my black leather jacket. I'm happy to say that my cat was fine and in good health. I had no further effects from the Dejur after that, but I found it to be an unpleasant experience, which seemed to have an evil connotation to it. I flushed the remaining Dejura down the toilet, and haven't tried it again since. I was deeply grateful that I was alone during this, because I believe if I had a sitter, he or she may have panicked when I fell so many times, and have me rushed to the hospital and that would have wrecked my career entirely. One thing is certain after all this, everybody's metabolism is different. I'm convinced that the dosage I took would have most probably been lethal to somebody else. My advice? Stay well away from this plant. Edibles gave me a nightmare trip, a story sent in by a subscriber. This takes place in what I believe to be the late summer of 2019. I can't say for certain though, because this was the time of my life where I was sleeping most of the day and smoking stupid quantities of pot, basically anything I could do to cope with my clinical depression, suicidal thoughts and PTSD. As you might guess, Waterboarding my brain in THC, and being starved of dopamine and serotonin for so long, results in some vague and blurry memories, but I do my best here to include as much detail as possible. With that disclaimer and context taken care of, let's jump into the story at hand. The entire situation begins when my dad and stepmom decide to leave town for a trip. I honestly can't remember what the purpose of the trip was. I guess it was to visit family or just go on vacation. But the only thing I was concerned with was the opportunity to blast my brain and avoid all semblance of real world responsibility. This was before weed was legalised in my state, so I made arrangements with my dealer to acquire as much bud as I could afford. My plan was to go full zooted Zaza zombie. I remember this being the only time in my life that I seriously considered stealing money, also I could afford more marijuana. I'm relieved when looking back on this situation that I never saw from my family, even though I had the opportunity to many times. Anyways, I cleared my wallet on several grams of my dealer's top shelf gelato that he got in from Colorado, just in time to start my binge the night my parents left town. By the time they had rolled out the driveway, I was already rolling and lighting a joint, and by the time the sun was beginning to set, it was time to move to the main phase of my plan. I crushed and spread the majority of my stash onto a baking tray to decarb in preparation for infusing some can of butter. I eyeballed the proportions and didn't really know what I was doing, so I really had no idea how strong it was going to be. As it turned out, it was extremely strong. This summer was unique, because it was a moth bloom year in my area. Moths literally covered the windows trying to get to the light and the light beams from lamps outside illuminated countless moths buzzing and flapping into one another. I love insects, and especially moths, so this is a notable part of the experience. 
Moths and butterflies are symbolic of death, and therefore transformation. Moths are active at night, and I feel the darker side of the symbol of transformation. I'm not a very spiritual person, but part of me likes to think that the moths ushered in the bad trip to come as a reflection of my deepest fears and traumas. As the night went on, I remember taking pictures of my face and being highly critical of my appearance. Some real vain vampire shit. The dogs watched my strange behaviour over the night with an expression like, the fuck? While my can of butter was infusing, I just kept smoking weed to get as high as I possibly could. At some point, I remember going into the backyard and walking back and forth listening to my music, completely creating a really cool video game in my head. I crafted the world, music, gameplay, look and characters for the game completely in my head, I remember feeling sad that I would never make this game in real life, because I lacked the discipline to do so. I eventually finished and strained the can of butter, and turned into sleep while watching YouTube. The next morning is when the trip really begins. I woke up still high, but that was good to me. I fed and pet the dogs, and lit up another joint to greet the day as stoned as possible. Today was the day I was going to saturate my brain in as much zar as possible. I made myself toast and tea. I spread several generous tablespoons of my nightmare can of butter onto some toast with jam, and added some more to a cup of tea. I went out back to sit and look at the yard as I ate. Fucking disgusting. The flavour was absolutely putrid and packed with weed turpines, and it took me a while to choke it all down. But in my mind at the time, it was completely worth it. But I was completely wrong. Eventually, I finally cleared my plate and my fate was sealed. I was already high, so the come up snuck on me somewhat, but I fairly quickly realised that things really looked distinct and beautiful. I seemed to consider objects in their entirety, and even the most mundane sights looked so beautiful. I remember plucking a sleeping moth off of the stucco wall, and delighting in its shape and form. I fixated on the tiny feathers that created grey patterns on its wings, until it buzzed out of my hand. Most people who have been very stoned can probably relate to what I'm saying about how amazing things can look. I just walked around my house and appreciated the beauty of everyday objects and scenes. Eventually, I noticed a static at the edge of my vision, as I continued to get higher and higher. The things in the corner of my eyes looked blurred and colourful, like pressing your palms to your closed eyes. My mind was so elsewhere that I could no longer appreciate the visual beauty around me. Things began to seem dull and far off. I did not even comprehend most of what I was looking at. I was feeling so high that staying upright felt difficult. I just felt so tired. So I decided to lie down and watch YouTube on my laptop. I spent an unknown amount of time just browsing YouTube. But eventually, I arrived at the topic of astro and particle physics. And considering particle behaviour in the Big Bang was absolutely crazy to my zooted mind. It was mad how I clearly was able to visualise properties like particle spin and probability clouds. I eventually came into a psychedelic state while watching videos of space. I realised that I was the universe observing itself. That the matter, energy and entropy that makes up and drives outer space, galaxies, other people, other life and myself, is all in fact the same stuff. I felt emotion at how much of an insane miracle and coincidence it is that I could live and think and see the universe, and therefore, myself. I realised that I was part of a beautiful and unbelievably big process, and that my identity, struggles and joys were all tiny specks in the grand scheme of things. I was just a tiny piece of the universe, given the gift of consciousness and perception. What a beautiful thing. What an honour. What a miracle. This was the highlight of what I realised now to be basically a full-on trip. After this realisation and sense of peace, the trip quickly spiralled downward into darkness. I essentially lost all sense of vision. Although, I am aware that I could see my surroundings, I was not connected to the inputs coming into my eyes, and was only able to really witness the images my mind generated. I started to think about how worthless I was to squander this miracle of life. I was a unique process given the privilege of thought, free choice, and the ability to influence the world, despite being composed of matter and processes that could not themselves be conscious or change the world. 
How foolish of me to spend my time getting high and feeling sorry for myself. Fucking worthless. I felt so critical of myself for not making an impact in the world, for not making things, for not researching and discovering, and for not forming emotional connections. I just felt so small and worthless. The absurd situation that is the universe conspired through coincidence to create the process and identity of me, and all I could do was feel depressed. These thoughts became more abstract and less based on words. I lost all concept of my surroundings and of myself as an ego or distinguished identity. I experienced a new world and identity composed of my own imagination and the absurd amount of THC flooding my brain. I was reduced to a low consciousness soul. I was a white orb, almost sperm shaped. I was in a dark, dull tube. I was fighting furiously to reach the end. I saw the end of the tunnel as it came out to a flared lip shape. I knew that I absolutely needed to reach the end, the other side. Life was on the other side. I reached the space beyond, but I couldn't quite escape. I slid backward in despair. I fought so hard to stop sliding, but I couldn't. I eventually slid out the other end of the tunnel in free fall. There was another tunnel just underneath the first tunnel waiting to catch me. I fell back through the second tunnel just like the first one. I was in horrified agony. I fought so hard trying to make progress to get up to the second tunnel, but I just couldn't. I fell backwards again and discovered tunnel after tunnel, each beneath the previous one. I realized that I had failed. I was a soul trying to achieve actualization and birth, but I couldn't make the cut. I fell and slid backwards for a small eternity. I eventually hit the bottom and fell into a small area. My surroundings were doldrums grey. I felt compressed and I panicked. I thrashed and I tried to escape, but I was imprisoned. No matter how I thrashed, moved or tried to free myself, I was held fast in a colourless membrane in a colourless box. I was so uncomfortable. I was squashed and suffocated and felt unbearably claustrophobic. This membrane would just not let me free of my confined area at all. My perspective then zoomed out, and I realised that I was one of many trapped and failed souls. We were all confined in these membranes in a square matrix that went on for eternity. I couldn't escape, because I would just bump up against more confines. These confines is all there was. Then they were cubes and the matrix of imprisoned souls stretched for eternity in all three dimensions, and then extra dimensions that I could not comprehend. I cannot truly convey the feeling of claustrophobia, of being trapped and suffocated in an infinite spiritual prison. There was no escape, because there was nothing else for me anymore. I was condemned. Eventually, I started to come down. I came back to my body and my identity, but I was very shaken. I was still high, but I decided to throw out the rest of the can of butter, realising that I had gone too far with it, and I felt that the can of butter itself was evil. I spent the next few hours trying to return to a normal brain space. I showered and took my dogs for a walk, which made me feel better. I eventually just went to sleep and woke up feeling still strange the next day. After the next few days had passed, I started to feel normal again. I've since experimented with LSD and mushrooms, but I've never experienced a psychedelic experience just like this experience I had. I have since improved my life after that long bout of depression. I live with my boyfriend now, and I'm pursuing education and a degree. I wrote this up to make peace of the experience. I now explain the trip as the manifestation of my depression and the pandemic to come. The soul trying to be born but feeling thwarted mirrored my struggle to reach adult actualization. Falling backwards into that prison was my own prison of my depression, and how I became stuck for so long in my depression, which is represented by the claustrophobic feeling as well as the depressing grey colour. The matrix of other souls could be thought of as all the other young adults out there feeling thwarted by depression in a late stage capitalist society without meaning. If you're going through depression right now, 
I promise it will get better. There'll be ups and downs, and life might not be exactly what you want or expect, but depression is an illusion that can only fade with time. Just don't underestimate the psychedelic properties of THC, and especially edibles. Unless you really do want to be immobilized in bed for several hours, experiencing firsthand the pain and terror of a soul failing to come into existence and condemned to eternal imprisonment. I went to hell and back to be able to tell you this. A 5 gram diphenhydramine trip report, posted by Cedric on August 7th, 2011. After around 20 minutes of consuming all the pills, I started to see mild distortions and audio hallucinations, mostly ticking and scratching, which seemed distant. I was inside the car which was going to the house I was supposed to spend my trip at. I kept telling my friend Martin not to interfere with the trip in any way unless it was obvious that I was in lethal danger. I noticed my memory span was becoming shorter and shorter, and the ticking and scratching was getting louder, along with a mild headrush-like high-pitched sound. Right before we reached this place, I realised I couldn't move, and my vision started glitching up. It kept flashing and freezing, and sometimes I wouldn't see anything at all for a split second. I told this to Martin, and he convinced me I could walk, I just had to do it carefully, so I followed him to the house. I was very, very heavy, and every time I looked at the floor, it seemed like my feet were sinking into it. I was left alone in the room, which was slowly melting all around me. Most of the furniture had bright, unusual outlines. At this point, I felt crawling all over my body. My vision flashed again and I found myself completely covered in spiderwebs. I moved my hands through them, which helped for a little while. My hands would go through them and they'd fade, but the webs would come back almost immediately. I could feel the sticky sensation on my skin, which made them seem just as real as I was. Then, there was a loud knock at the window. I turned around to see someone standing behind it, so I opened it. I heard music coming from outside, it was different from what I heard during my last trip, but strangely familiar and similar to it. Let's go, Cedric, said the creature, and I climbed out the window without much consideration. It was extremely hard to walk. The grass and the trees seemed grainy, and it looked like they were moving, crawling, breathing and living. My sense of time was severely distorted. A few steps would feel like an eternity or would just black out and confuse fairly long periods of time for a single second. We were heading towards the music, the creature walking a few steps ahead of me. After a while, I started noticing lights, probably torches, amongst these trees and hundreds of moths around them. The air was full of moths, and they would land on me and fly around. I tried my best to keep them out of my face, failing miserably. Finally, we reached a clearing. There were many people there. At the front, very still, stood my relatives, all dressed in black, surrounded by shadows and people I don't know. They all seemed frozen and had the same blank expression on their faces, eyes fixed on me. I tried to talk, but my voice got stuck in my throat. It was extremely sore and dry. I started feeling a mixture of guilt and fear, but as I could tell, they all knew the creature took me here because of DPH, and considering most of them were dead, I wasn't even sure if I was alive. Suddenly, there was a very unpleasant crackling sound and a white flash. The creature who took me here was gone now, and everyone was just walking around and talking, completely ignoring me. I decided to sit down because of the heaviness. After a while, I noticed a black dot moving through the grass towards me very quickly with the corner of my eye. Then, 
I'd feel a bulge moving under my shirt at the right shoulder. I freaked out and smacked it, and a black rat fell out of my sleeve. It looked dead, but every time I took my attention off it, it would disappear and run and hide under my shirt again. I was terrified of it for some reason, and after around five loops of this happening, I started beating it repeatedly after it dropped out of my sleeve. I did this until the rat's body turned into some sort of rubber goo. Its legs were still moving, but after this it wouldn't touch me again. But I did keep seeing its distorted body with the trembling legs from time to time throughout the trip. I quickly stood up and went to a different spot. I was approached by my mother, and she was crying. Why did you do this, Cedric? I warned you. I told her not to worry, and I was going to be fine, which was obviously bullshit. Other people froze in place again, and I could hear voices saying, We warned you. What have you done? Even though their lips weren't actually moving. The longer I looked at them, the more distorted they would get, until they formed these bug eyes and arms reaching the ground. Another flash followed. I was back at the front yard of the house and saw Martin standing by me. I assumed he shook me. He was asking if I was alright, and I've been standing here for ages. He had these spiders in his hair. I tried to say yes, but I couldn't because my mouth was so painfully dry. I began to walk my way towards the house, but later on after all this, Martin told me I never even went there in the first place. The whole trip thus far has been experienced right after stepping out of the car, standing and moving around at that very spot. There are many blackouts at this point. I recall centipedes from my last trip and spiders all over me and inside me. Around ten of them crawled out of my mouth. July 13th I woke up the next day still tripping hard. I never remembered even falling asleep. I went to check the next room. Martin told me I was out for around five hours. I then later found out that he was still asleep and the information was completely false. I managed to get some water and go to the bathroom because the urge to pee was terrible. Moving was still a difficult task and I couldn't concentrate properly. This is when I posted, alive, the previous report. When I got back to the living room, I saw someone sitting on the couch. It stood up and I recognised the figure as the hat man. He walked towards me and said, You are getting in and running out. I started to feel extremely hazy and got another head rush. I'm not sure if I left the sofa or blacked out and lay down on it, but I was there at the edge of sleep, and the hat man was looking right at me. This might be a dream, or a full-blown trip. I don't remember closing my eyes, and I could still feel my surroundings. I was in an extremely vast room. The floor, ceiling, and walls were all black. There were no doors, and I couldn't see where it ended, because darkness hid it out of sight. There was a woman standing right in front of me. She looked at me, smiled, and took her face off as if it was a mask. The face behind it looked exactly the same, but she was bleeding from her eyes, mouth and nose, and her eyes were completely black. I looked around the room once again, to see faces appearing on the walls and ceiling, greeting me without words, until they started to fall down like masks as well revealing bruised and blood-covered faces. The masks would then turn into ash that wouldn't settle, but move around the floor and feet. That's about all I can remember from this stage of the trip. After I snapped out of this, I laid there for a while, feeling my heart beat rapidly. The hat man was gone. My hallucinations were mostly audio now. I heard lots of incomprehensible whispers and quiet singing, I posted on this thread again and decided to go to sleep for real. I was so very tired. This time, I drifted into a deep, deep sleep. After a while had passed, I realised I was sleeping. My vision was completely black until this room began to appear. It was small and grey, 
its door open, displaying nothingness. I walked towards the door and stepped out of the room. Several shadows approached me. The door then shut and I heard, you are out, very clearly and felt this burning pain in my chest. Martin said I started screaming. He tried to wake me up and check my pulse. He realised what was happening and called me an ambulance. Let me tell you, I had to down a lot of charcoal and I had minor hallucinations for around three days. Insanity and Death A 28 dried gram mushroom trip report posted to Shroomery 12 years ago. A few months ago after a long time where I wasn't tripping for some odd reason, I would take a large number of psychedelics that would hit everyone else except for me. I decided to take the penis envy mushrooms again, them being the only mushrooms that I've ever actually tripped on. Because I was having such a hard time tripping, I decided to eat an ounce of dried penis envy. We got to the beach at around 6.30 or 7. I had more than half of the mushrooms soaking lemon juice on the way. I started munching on them as soon as we got there and took almost an hour to eat them all. I'd started tripping within 30 minutes, but nothing too much. Just the giggles, weird colours all around me. Nothing much really. A little after the hour mark it started hitting me pretty hard, but I didn't seem to notice, I just thought everyone was going kinda crazy. I heard all my friends laughing hysterically and talking random crap for what I felt was hours, and it started to get on my nerves. It turned out that they were actually all quietly staring at the sky in reality. I started telling them again and again to just shut up, shut up. Then I started hearing these weird voices everywhere screaming in other languages. I looked up, and there's people all over the beach. Now I'm really aggravated. I start having difficulties breathing. I started to enter a panic. I felt my heart rate increase tremendously, and at first I saw this as a danger, but not life-threatening. I told my friend I couldn't breathe. I, I can't breathe. My friends then start fighting with each other as usual, which got me completely pissed off, and made everything so much worse. It's now hard for me to catch a breath, and I feel like I'm having an asthma attack. I started pouring sweat. I must have lost five pounds in water. I had this 10 foot circle of sand around me wet from my sweat and my body temperature was so high. Now I'm not only worried about not breathing but also dehydration. At this point for some reason I thought I was rolling too and that was causing the dehydration. I started losing my sanity more and more and my complaining to my friends started becoming aggressive demands and soon led me to screaming at the top of my lungs. It was right now that I was tripping so hard that I could not make out my actual surroundings. It was just all hallucinations. From then on, I was completely blind for a few hours. Everything I saw and heard was hallucinations, way stronger than any DMT trip I've ever had. I looked up and all around me were these green, sexless, muscular people, all staring at the moon and doing a semi-dance or jumping motion and chanting in this weird language. I actually felt really sober in that moment which made me feel even worse because I thought I was actually dying and not tripping at all. I then got the idea of running to a small convenience store nearby, killing the clerk and stealing the water for my own survival. I stood up, which is easier said than done, and when I looked for the way out of the beach, all I saw was sand in every direction, endless sand, and it was daytime. I was all alone, dying. My misery started to slowly turn to torture, I started to feel some of my organs working overload and others shutting down. I felt like I was burning alive. At this point, I was a killing machine, and nobody could get close to me. Most of the time, I was with my face in the sand, my eyes wide open and screaming at the top of my lungs. Fuck. Fuck you. I'm fucking dying. I felt that anyone who stood in front of me was a threat to my survival, and if I was going to die, I would take him with me. I not only felt like I was dying, I felt like I was being murdered. 
I thought I saw a muscular figure in front of me and I tried to kill him with a big rock, but it turned out to just be a handful of sand. I then proceeded to punch the ground as hard as I could. Nobody would get near me. I felt completely unstoppable right now. Someone could have shoved a spear through my chest and I would have pulled it out and beat them to death with it. As more and more time passed, I tried harder and harder to fight my death. I wouldn't go out without a fight. I was ready to do anything to survive. I'd even cut myself open and do my own surgery, as I could actually diagnose myself at that point in time. I knew what was going on and where it was in my body. I remembered I was dehydrated, so I ran to the ocean and dragged two people into the water who were in my way. It took all of my strength to get up, as I'd sometimes try and get up and immediately my body would shut down and I'd fall face first. When I got to the ocean I started gulping salt water, before quickly realising that I would dehydrate even more, so I decided to just hydrate my body by just staying in the water itself. Then, all the screaming stopped, and I heard a weird voice saying, Rip out your eyes. I immediately saw a dagger fly past me with an eyeball and I tried gouging out my eyes, but then realised what I was doing, and I fell into a trance and all I could see were these pyramids with eyeballs. I kept feeling overjoyed as I had figured out what they meant, but then remembered I was dying and would begin screaming again. I got stuck in this loop for a while, repeating the same thing over and over and I finally gave up and realised I was going to die regardless of what I do. I just decided to lay down and wait for my death, which would hopefully be soon. When I did lay down, the pyramids came back, then I saw the earth and I would zoom into different parts of it and see wars being fought and a lot of people being killed. After a while, I decided I couldn't handle it anymore. I decided I want to kill myself. I looked around for a knife to cut myself open but found none, so I decided to drown instead. I threw myself in the water, I waited for what seemed like 30 minutes, although it was obviously less. My girlfriend pulled me out of the water. I decided everything I did was useless as I was too weak to do anything anymore, so I decided to lay down and die with a smile. After about another 20 or 30 minutes of me just smiling, talking shit and waiting to die, my body suddenly lost all feelings, and in front of me I saw this portal in the shape of a vertical eye, and inside was a swirling pattern of eyeballs that is almost impossible to put on paper. I went through this portal and suddenly everything went black. I was finally dead. I could see my lifeless body being dragged to the sidewalk, but I was finally happy. The eye opened my eyes, and I was on a cloud and all around me were light people, much like the ones from DMT, only much more defined and with wings. There was about twelve of them, in the distance was this palace. This place was the brightest I've ever seen, and one of these angels kneeled down and held my hand and I felt the most intense euphoria ever. I never imagined I could be so happy. I felt like I was finally home. I'd made it to heaven, and I'd spend eternity there. It brings me to tears thinking about it. After a few moments, all of the angels got around me and grabbed me. They lifted me up, and they were going to take me to somewhere. The palace, perhaps. After a few moments, I felt my body moving, and I was dropped on the sidewalk. I was sitting at this point and everything was a reddish tint, and my girlfriend was in front of me, assuring me that I was okay and that I was indeed alive. I was actually disappointed to be back. It took me a good 10 to 15 minutes for me to get oriented, and to stand up and leave to avoid police clearing the beach at 2am. After this, I was tripping for another 2 hours or so, like if on an 8th, but I felt sober since it had been so intense. I only knew I was actually tripping from looking in a mirror. This trip was followed by another bad trip on 5 grams, although not nearly as bad, and two more really uncomfortable and strange trips of 7 and 5 grams again. Every time I eat mushrooms, I get scared, but I always have a positive outcome and also very strange purging halfway through the trip. Thank you for taking the time to read my long trip report. I had to leave a lot out, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. Check out this drawing, which is kind of what it was like. To the left is the suffering I was going through, and to the right is heaven, the place I went after I went through hell. In the middle, the blue man is what my girlfriend saw, 
while I was going through the experience. And the beings by the pyramid are the beings that visit us in our trips. Oh, and the pyramid, of course, is God. bugged out. A Datura trip report by Deuce, posted to Erewid.org October 21st, 2002. Just recently, I've discovered that the hundreds of plants growing uncontrollably on my family's farm are that of Datura. For years, I've been overlooking the plant as if it were any other, until a horse of ours got sick from ingesting quite a few leaves. The vet came out to check on him, and informed me that the plant, aka jimson weed, was poisonous if ingested by animals, but had a quite pleasant high if ingested or smoked by people. For a little over a year, I ignored this information entirely, along with the plant itself. Until one day, I was riding home from school with a friend, and we somehow began talking about the shortage of marijuana we'd been having and the jimson weed growing around my house was brought up. Really enthusiastically, she told me a friend of hers ate a few of the same seeds and tripped for over 12 hours. I almost laughed, but I told her I would check it out, and sure enough, the seeds were identical to Datura stramonium. For nearly a week, I researched Datura, and learned more than I thought possible about it. I thought it was a little much for what I'm used to, because I've never gotten stronger than marijuana or ecstasy, but I decided it was an experience that I was ready for, and unfortunately, I was very wrong. At around 9.30 on a Thursday night, I chewed and swallowed a teaspoon of the very bitter, black, mature seeds, and washed them down with Gatorade. I chose Gatorade because of the intense dehydration that I've read about. I had a sitter for this experience, we can call her Tori, which is needed while on this stuff I will say. Around 10.45 my mouth became so dry that it was sickening and impossible to talk. I began to talk what sounded perfectly normal in my head, but utter gibberish to my ears and to Tori. It would have been very frustrating if I'd needed to say something important, but since I didn't, Tori and I found it entertaining. I got the dilated pupils and the constant using the bathroom thing, but besides that, it was nothing too intense. About an hour later, Tori and I decided to crash, which was fine with me because my throat was so dry that it was no fun talking whatsoever. I'm not sure what time I woke up, but it must have been around 10am because Tori had to be at work by 12 I was tripping hard, but nothing seemed too unnormal to me. Random people watching me go to the bathroom, Tori disappearing in the middle of our conversation, and spending hours in front of the mirror talking to my new friend, which turned out to be my reflection. As weird as this sounds, it was all seeming very normal to me at the time. Every once in a while, I would snap back to myself and realise I was tripping. I'd kind of laugh or shake my head at myself, only to find me doing it all over again a few minutes later. At one point, me and my sister, who knew nothing about me taking the seeds, was making my bed and I kept telling Tori to get up so I could finish. But she just stared at me, even though I asked her more than once. My sister kept asking, Who are you talking to? Tori. I would answer, and point to the corner of my bed where she was lying down. A little shocked and kind of scared, my sister said, Tori left 20 minutes ago. And not believing her, I frantically began throwing back my bed covers expecting to find her and prove that she was, after all, in my bed. 
I kept putting things down that disappeared constantly. I'd walk around the house talking to every inanimate object that would talk back to me. None of this was too strange. It was until I looked in my closet. Me and a couple people I'd never met before, obviously hallucinations, were going through my closet to pick out an outfit to wear to school. Even though I wasn't supposed to be going to school for a few more days. I got kind of lonely after they disappeared, but kept looking for an outfit anyways. Suddenly, I spotted a shirt of mine with a few little white bugs on it. I panicked and my mind raced. What if these bugs are on me? I mean, I wear these shirts on the regular. It was after this that I instantly became paranoid. I looked on my arm and saw bugs digging underneath and crawling under my skin. I ran out of my room to find my mum, screaming to her about the bugs on my body. Of course, she said she saw nothing, but I just figured she was trying to comfort me. I continued clawing at the bugs, but they were too fast and strong for me to stop. My mum's first reaction from seeing me like this was that I was going for a bad acid trip. But from the seriousness and paranoia in my voice, she started taking me seriously. She then immediately called every doctor to see if any of them could take an emergency visit. She then drove me over to the first one available. FYI, because of this, I now have lost a great deal of respect for doctors. The doctor immediately looked at me and decided I was having an unexplained allergic reaction to who knows what. By now though, I'm red all over and bleeding in areas where I tried to get these bugs. She figures the redness is my skin breaking out and not inflicted by my own self. I now have to apply this cream over my entire body and continue to take a million antibiotics for something I don't even have and only I know I never really had. So whoever decides they want an unforgettable experience, please be careful. Being scared beyond belief is no fun. And let me add that nothing about the entire trip was the least bit fun or pleasant. It was weird and confusing and 100% out of control. The pupil dilation left me totally letterblind for a week. The dry mouth left my throat hurting for an entire week. And not to mention a mild depression about myself that continued after it. If you're looking for a good high for the night, Please skip to Chura. Holy Hyperspace Freakout, a DPT trip report by St. Eric, posted to Earwid.org July 18, 2000. Before I get into this report, I just wanted to clear up the fact that this guy refers to himself in the third person throughout this uh, report, so he'll actually reference himself as being Eric, so it'll sound like he's talking about someone else, but he's actually talking about him. So on Tuesday, Eric set himself up horizontal with a tape recorder, a magic journal, water, earplugs, a blindfold, etc, and snorted 250 milligrams of DPT, the pure powder, a foul tasting and odorous product. After 10 minutes, I was very shaky, trembling, vibrating. The same vibrations that rock the skeleton spread to shake the whole room. He tears off his earplugs and blindfold. Pan has entered the inner room, panic. The air is dense with shifting, dancing fractal shrimp. Geometry of visions is sharp, sliding. No thing is solid. How was I ever fooled into thinking it was in the first place? No thing can be held in my hands for too long. No place to observe from, no repose. Cannot rest on a blanket and pillow, which are molecules racing up to light speed, 
and the poor primate nervous system protest quantum physics in everyday life. He vomits fluorescent yellow and green into a crystal bathtub, suddenly sucked into an alternate world, out on the shimmering night streets with dark purple women. Now, back in the room, how long was he gone? Is this still going on? The world's gushing alive. Next, he's a yogi, suddenly overwhelmed with psychic energy. The third eye and crown chakra explode, eyes and mouth shocked open, doubled over onto knees. Sky of room invaded, blooming with fierce fire wheels. Mandalas send flaming electric shards to pierce repeatedly with real pain, as real as any phenomenal skin mutilation. The jolt sent to muscles, nerves, moaning and screeching in pain. Helpless. The next world was a room with some guy in it. Eric has repeatedly done work to arrange situations and experiences and experiments so as to entertain himself and then to write down what happens. But this time, he's gone too far. The experiment was too powerful and consumed the laboratory. The guy begins yelling, What the fuck did you do this for? I don't know. Both of them experienced terrible fear breaking up simultaneously with the room into cells, molecules, light, shaking violently as in an apocalyptic earthquake. Conceptions burnt out of skulls by endless light. The whole universe itself falls apart. All colours in electric air whirlpool into a mandala, eaten up forever. That's it. The world is over. Watching from the outside, it's very obvious that the human world was as stable as a house of toothpicks. It was amazing it didn't fall apart sooner in history, but the hideous human angel hasn't been crawling along the planet that long at all. And now, someone had pulled the plug out accidentally. He would find himself several times in a quasi-human world, with various bodies. Man, woman, old bum, machine, a teen girl, a cartoon, etc. With a fully different set of memories and characteristics, living some schizoid life for a few intense minutes, and then the whole thing would be eaten up into a mandala that throbs in space and would never fail to shock and horrify him. It's cold out here. Where's home? I want to go back. Where is home? Once, floating bodiless, no limbs to flail in protest, he asked why was the whole earth human-ape contraption ever even running? Why does everyone have to struggle and suffer and get caught in animal drama if it's all just going to close down anyway and nobody gets no thing? Answer. It wasn't what you thought it was. It was not a difficult test. The organic world is like a ride, a warm 3D roller coaster. Once you get on it, you forget you were ever anywhere else because you're so overwhelmed by the colours and nerve explosions and density of it all. From outside, this is clear. The universe is such a festive, holy space. To have meat bodies. What an opportunity for joy that is. So meanwhile, inside the wheel, inside the earth world which goes on and on, whilst a few escape momentarily to see it from afar, as psychonauts or by death, death lets you out. Eric's body vehicle was raging psychotic, involved in all sorts of instinctive surrealism. With the source of attention chemically locked in other dimensions, the body continued to act upon itself in the environment. Thrashing, howling, broke up an empty fish tank as well that was in the room, throwing glass into the bathtub, with which it climbed into wearing thermal underpants and proceeded to use soap and glass shards to wash itself or something. Perhaps it was enjoyable. Maybe the glass looked very beautiful. Maybe it seemed like flowers or sponges or pieces of the body of God. I don't know. I don't remember. At this point, the neighbours across the hall called the police and rescue squad, because sound effects mimic someone being severely beaten. Isn't the human world so funny? You can't go too far in any direction without someone coming in and scooping you up. Hold on. Come back here. The report that he was given was that everyone feared him. He appeared possessed, berserk, amok, etc. It took five large men to subdue, and five times the usual dose of Atavan to tranquilise the body. This seems humorous now, and there's no memory of it available for viewing, only a few lovely scars. An objective video recording of this trip, 
would be the most amazing action film he could ever watch. The closest memory he has of that scene is being one of a cult of beautiful wise children that sit up in wooden apartments smoking psychedelic mushrooms all day. We speak in a language that's evolved from English and sci-fi lingo and is able to describe the otherwise incomprehensible experiences we share. One word retrieved into this world is hysteroid, which describes a mixed state of hysteria and psychoid traits. As in, I don't know what's up with him, he's been acting like such a hysteroid lately. Police came in, violent and ready to punish, and we were just like, oh, those guys, and ignored them. We knew there was no act more revolutionary than disassembling and reassembling reality in our own bedrooms. We were such perfect detached space explorers that the other poor humans' cries of protest and fear were less than the buzzing of dizzy flies. For the majority of the trip, there was no knowledge of ever having ingested a supplement called DPT, or any idea of Eric's life at all. There were a few flashes of the room, but it was wildly transformed into a savagely abstract version with additional people, objects, new animals, furniture, etc. There was a recurring experience of being someone who had gone insane and couldn't control the seizure dancing body as it was propelled through life, running at 20 times the speed and intensity of ever before. He was being thrown bodily upstairs and down streets, through alleys and buildings and windows and plant life, and especially drowning in infinitely deep rainbow oceans. He saw morphing bodies and minds, Faces exploding endlessly into a geezer of chaotic nature forms, and information living so violently inside the present moment that there was no memory, no time for history, and no anticipation, because every moment so incredibly bizarre and new that that prediction itself would be ridiculous. The auditory information was a constant experience of weird echoing sounds, electronicish sounds formed physically, emotionally, and visually present many frequently resembling an unintelligible machine voice, or terrible freakish animal screams, or both. One world contained a sleek futuristic version of Eric and his friends, allies in a magical group based on revelations understood in a space accessible with a certain chemical key. This space shows this world, though through a lens so different that it becomes almost unrecognisable. You enter a wild stream of information that seems to be the raw chaos that permeates everything always. We call the knowledge gained in this space, in the state of receiving it, schizophrenic truth. One level of it, as you come closer back to your usual state, reveals life as a ride on an ever-blooming point, hajit, or rather, a continuous explosion of sensation channeled into the forms of your body and environment, which also is surrounded by infinite other pockets of experience, the collection of which is hyperspace, knew it. We may access any of these points as rooms in an endless hotel, each room itself a universe, a complete life, or both, and travel as trans-dimensional nomads through alien territories until the chemical wears off, and we slip back into our home-based world with the obvious knowledge that is one among infinite others inside the inconceivable freakiness of mummer nature. Eric woke up at 6am the next morning, vomiting charcoal in New Orleans Charity Hospital, attached to a cartoon yellow catheter. The charcoal was for the fruitless project of trying to pump his stomach. Supposedly, the body was having seizures and later was put on a respirator. He signed a release from saying he would stop using drugs and collapsed into a taxi home wearing fat bleeding lips, a chipped tooth, many wide open smiling cuts, maroon bruises, and the world famous asexual hospital gown. Once again, Eric had found himself in the wrong culture. Any good old South American shaman or shamaness would tell you that spitting, screaming, vomiting, seizing, thrashing, mutilation, and visions of the body's destruction and end are all part of the extraterrestrial voyage. In the days following this, the body was drained and weak, and feared that the world would dissolve into a ruthless, all-consuming mandala, and my precious animal incarnation would be game over. This fear is extremely useful for enjoying the moment-to-moment -moment life. In the weeks following all this, each time we smoked cannabis, the DPT imagery would turn on in the visual display, and a few playbacks of 3D sounds were witnessed. 
While in meditation, certain sounds, voices and images bubbled up which seemed to be parts of the trip and mental recordings of the rescue squad's voices, as well as the roommate's voice trying to communicate with him. But even with the bloody drama and overwhelming emergency, Eric regrets nothing and considers this one of the most potent and educational days of his Earth life so far. The Octopus, a DMT trip report, posted by the user Blackclaw to the DMT Nexus on the 2nd of November 2006. Hey guys, I've found this rather intense DMT trip report from another forum. It's pretty wild. I packed the pipe with weed, and then on the dope, I placed with my brother's miniature pocket knife blade what I thought to be a little bit of the brown crystally goo, about three match heads worth. I torched carefully above the cone, and sucked for all it was worth. Firstly, before anything, I noticed that my head had disappeared. Well, rather it was more like it no longer had boundaries as such. Then, the ringing in my ears and the hideous rush of a vascular headache occurred. The ringing deepened and became richer, louder. Then, a great bell tolled. Ask not for whom it tolls. The terrified attempt to calm myself failed miserably, as the vibration shattered me into an infinitum. I was still sitting there in the garden, so I knew I could go further. Lacking bodily coordination, I dumped roughly half of what I had left on the foil. I had been told it was a gram, the whole thing. Put this on a similar cone to the first, and repeated the torching. This time, because I could no longer tell if I possessed lungs, I must have pulled down the whopper of a hit, and what happened next is very hard to describe. The fear went up 1,000 notches. My knuckles, if I still had them, would have certainly been white, like the light that was consuming my whole body. Blazing white light all around. Fortunately, the headache subsided with the second hit, and I felt ready to extend my senses to feel where I was and what was happening. I remembered the veil, like rubber, or the surface of jelly stretched in front of me. There were no geometric patterns, a few weird fractals burnt like green fire from every surface I could see in the garden. I was in two places at once, it was so odd, and there was this veil like the surface of some deep pond before me. Then, something moved beyond it, was that some sort of dorsal fin. I leaned forward to touch the surface of the membrane, and then what happened next I swear nearly killed me from its sheer bizarrity. From behind the white chair, or was it from inside it, a creature emerged. It was not a happy, smiley elf. To tell you the truth, I cannot, I will not describe what I saw. It had innumerable tentacles. It's like a cross between some weird octopus or jellyfish. And the eyes. Oh my god, the eyes. I froze on the spot thinking, shit, this is it. I've really gone and done it now. Fucking toast. I never believed. I really should have believed. And now, now I'm at the mercy of something much, much bigger and complex and clever and definitely more malevolent than myself. I asked it its name, although I wish I had not asked. Its voice utterly destroyed me. It was like being caught in a storm of psychic noise, a whirlwind of deadly electrical shrapnel. I think I shuddered and started to drool uncontrollably at this point. I think I also urinated in my jeans. With its innumerable eyes, it gazed at me steady and extended a tendril. At that same moment, 
It fired a beam of light directly between and above my eyes. The alien laser was pinkish green. It hurt. I begged it to stop. I whimpered. Please stop. You're hurting me. I'm just fragile. Please be careful. I'm sentient as well. I mean you no harm. It seemed to consider what I had to say for a brief moment. The laser was withdrawn, but the tendrils, of which there were more now, still held me in place. I was trying to make out details of its shape or structure, but the closer I looked, the more it slipped away from me. It seemed to tell me in some weird non-verbal fashion not to struggle, and to stop making noise with my eyes. I personally took this to mean, be calm, do not struggle, clear your head, see, but do not look. It then became a little clearer. It seemed to be cloaked in some way, some sort of organic hood and covering was wrapped around it, some sort of armour or protection. The tentacles had no substance as we know it, and the eyes, well, they were the most awe-inspiring and terrifying things I have ever beheld. They defied counting. They defied reason. This whole thing was too much, and I felt myself losing my mind. I just lost it. Gone. I can't recall all that much after this, except it rifling through my mind like it were a chest of drawers. Some rewiring took place. An awesome amount was uploaded to my cortex, and a sensation not unlike being at the dentist while being semi-conscious from nitrous. This sense of voices telling you it'll be all over soon, and that you've done really well. Really well. Hush, hush now. Then, when I was able, and the pinkish greenish light was withdrawn, I felt I could once again move. The creature had split into three, or maybe it had always been three, and there were several smaller blobs that were crawling around my feet. It seemed to be trying to sneak up on me. Fuck that, I thought, and kept a close eye on them, lest they molest me like their larger, scarier accomplice. It was at this point that I realised that the blobs were not the same as the other creature or creatures. They were entirely different, extremely tricky and fast moving. One of them crawled up my leg and sat on my knee. Frankly, I was too horrified and fascinated to stop it. I noticed it had a little hat. It had little stripy white and green trousers as well, and pointy curly shoes. But at this point, let's just say I wasn't at home anymore. They seemed friendly enough, and I let them crawl inside my nose and ears and chest and legs and, well, whatever it was they wanted to enter. Eventually, it all faded, and further attempts to enter the world were prohibited. It seemed I'd been barred for now. Just a headache and a sensation of, no, no. Okay, just typing that out has made me feel all weird, and I need a stiff drink after that. Thank you, and good night. Oh, but before I go, I must say that, no, I had not read many DMT trip reports prior to this. This is what I truly find disturbing about it all. Frankly, I do not require another's belief that this really happened to me. I can barely get my head around it myself. Why elves? Why elves, damn it? And what's with the Philip K. Dick type entity? I swear, I had not been exposed to those particular stories before this experience. A 
near-death Bromo Dragonfly experience, posted to shroomery.org 12 years and 8 months ago by the user Goddess of Love. First of all, I'll apologise for my bad English. Here are the trip details. The onset begins 5 hours and 0 minutes after ingestion. The total duration of the trip is approximately 48 to 52 hours. This story takes place one day on Sunday in September. It was pretty boring that day, so I decided to have fun with three friends of mine. I'll call them A, B and C. I made an appointment with my friends outside in a parking lot near a forest, if the trip goes wrong. 11am. I decided to take a bottle that I thought was LSD. Until the trip began, we rolled a joint of marijuana and smoked it. I spoke a little with my friends, and I told them that I could be crazy on acid, so that it's important to pay attention to me. We decided to take a walk in the city until the onset, to return to the parking lot afterwards. 12am. An hour passes, and no effect of the onset occurs. We decide to go for a bite to eat. We look for a sandwich place nearby. Afterwards, we return to the parking lot. 1pm. Two hours later, and nothing happens. I find it boring, and decided to take another blotter. Here was the biggest mistake of my life. My friends are a little disturbed at the idea of taking a second blotter. We're still talking and waiting until the onset begins, and it's still not there. 2pm. Nothing happens yet. My cell phone vibrates and I receive a message from the one who sold me the LSD. The message says, Hey dude, how are you? No problems I hope. Everything going well? From that moment, I knew something was wrong. But it was far too late. I took the blotters, and all I had to do is wait for them to take effect. While I'm walking with my friends, I notice that the ground began to breathe. And this is when the onset began. 2.30pm we went to the parking lot as planned. On the road there, the houses began to be in this painting style, as if Van Gogh had painted them. And the more I walked, I had the impression of entering into the world of the Simpsons family. There were flowers, a sky, houses, cars, they all looked like a cartoon, everything being colourful and sweet. It was really great at this point. I really enjoyed contemplating this landscape as it revealed itself to me. On the road, I could see strange Egyptian motifs and sometimes in the sky there were mathematical equations that loomed in. My vision was very sensitive by now. I could see very far distance, and I could see every detail of each object, flowers and trees around me. 3pm. We finally arrived at the parking lot. When I entered it, everything was very mysterious. For example, between the road that separated the parking lot, it was a magical portal where only those with superior minds have the right to enter. This parking lot was my sanctuary, my power is over it, and I can control and manage it in any way I want. The onset was here. Trees strangely looked like those of the game Kirby. It was crazy. I could see every detail of the trees, yet they were very far away from me. I could also control the time and change the colours in my own way. The blue might be green, the black could be white, etc. As for my friends, their faces were filled with emotions. I could read their minds. One was nervous. The other doesn't seem to understand why I trip. I amused myself with a friend. He was really like Krusty the Clown when I touched him. All these crazy colours began coming out of his body. I really enjoyed that moment. I felt pretty well for the next 30 minutes. I seemed to be having fun. After a stick of wood drew my attention, I took it in my hands and I suddenly found myself in a Viking ship. The parking lot itself turned into a spaceship where I had the impression of seeing the water rise from the ground. I shake the stick in my hands to move it, and it was really enjoyable. 3.30pm. My friend asks if it's going well. They all remarked that I'm quite pale, and that my lips became purple, bluish colour. But I did not pay attention. I was so good in my own little magical world. My friends really want me to go home though. So they forced me to go home because for them, I was going wrong and I was saying some stupid shit. I said to them, Okay, we will go home. But then I noticed that the environment became this greying sort of colour. I asked myself full of questions. What will my mother say if she sees me in this state? I was supposed to come back home in 5pm. On the way, I became psychotic and crazy. 
It had happened in my street where my house was in. Here, the objects around me in the city had a soul, and items were driven to cry. 4pm. So, here's the bad trip. I saw my house all dark and aggressive. My mum wanted me to open the door. The house called me. In the exterior windows I could see vicious shadows. My friends leave me at my home. I opened the door, and my mother was there in the hallway. I wanted to dodge her and get up quickly into my bedroom, but she yells, Tell me what's happened to you! I heard her footsteps on the stairs, and my heart fluttered at full speed. I also had this strange feeling that I was quickly teleporting to every corner of my room. It was as if my body and my mind wanted to avoid my mother entirely. My mum was there, and she said, Oh my god, look at your lips! What are you doing? She was very upset. I was huddled in a corner of my room. My mother shouted, I'll tell your father about this. In the living room, I heard my father who said, Holy fuck, he's taken drugs, etc. My father came up and told me very angrily, Bastard, little asshole. He wanted to hit me and I started crying. I told him, Sorry dad, sorry, I'm so sorry I took LSD, excuse me please. He was so upset, and he was yelling to my mum, Call the ambulance quickly or he'll die. He was so nervous and said to me to come in the living room. I follow him, and boom, total mindfuck. He gives me water, and I immediately spit it out, thinking he wants to poison me. My father tells me I was a fucking shit, and totally crazy. My little brother freaked me out like hell. He was like, boo, and I was bumping off the fear. There, my father told me to sit down. My mother was in the kitchen, and she had phoned the hospital, and I had to be brought to the emergency room immediately. 4.30pm What I'm going to explain now is very hard to understand. It would really live the experience to understand it. I was in the living room, and there I saw my life began to scroll in front of me. I don't know how to explain it, but every step I reached that corresponded to a period of my life, from life to death. I really had a great auditory hallucination from now. For example, my father said, Our oh, son was so good, why has he done this? And when I got up from the chair to go in the car, it was as if I was dead. I was physically dead, but mentally present. When I got up out the window, I really saw the car as a hearse. When I was in my hallway to go towards the car, opening the door I saw the neighbours who were sad and my mum was crying deeply. When I entered the car, my arms crossed like a dead person. I truly felt like I was in a hearse. My mother cried a lot, and I heard my parents say, first we're going to the morgue, or the cemetery. And I just couldn't speak anymore. I had this huge body load and couldn't even feel my body. It was really sad. I really thought I was dead. And then, I saw the steps. I mean, when someone dies, he goes first to the morgue and the funeral, with related friends, family, etc., and then finally afterwards to the cemetery. Well, for me, it was the same. On the way, I saw through the window of the car. I saw my friends with flowers in their hands. They were only pedestrians, but as I said, their hallucinations were so strong that I thought they were my friends. Throughout the way, I saw all the friends I knew, all the members of my karate club, and I really saw the cars of those of my club who were escorting my car to my final destination. Funeral home in the street. I knew almost all of the people there. Some were crying, and I could read all their feelings on their faces. Arriving at the hospital, the emergency room, my father took me by the hand, and I heard the voice again. Come sir, we'll take you. It won't hurt. We arrived at the counter, and there was a waiting room next. I then looked into the room, and then boom. I saw all the people I knew who looked at me with a sad and helpless feeling. Every person I'd ever known in my life. Sadness were on their faces. A medic asked me to sit down in a wheelchair to take me in a small room. If you want, the hospital was heaven, and I saw that I had died and had to access to heaven. In the room, the doctor asked me what I took. I replied that I had taken LSD, and then, black hole. A few seconds later, still in the same room, the doctor was gone, and I was on a chair. A voice said, it won't hurt. And here, I thought that they can do nothing, and they were going to disconnect me from the real world. I thought they were going to trip me for life. 
I told the doctor sadly. But I don't know what death is. Is it going to hurt? I repeat this at least a dozen times. And he said to me, No, it will not hurt. Let yourself go. On the door which was at the opposite, I saw the last ten seconds of my life. Every second appeared on the door. Everything made sense. I started with the joint. I've not found love. I could not realise my greatest dream of my life. Meet Emma Watson. <laughs> Don't blame me. Then I started taking LSD until I die. If you want, you could say that this all started by me taking the joint, so I disobey my parents. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it was as if everything had a sense, and that it was all connected for me, to my death. I reviewed all the moments where it started. My first marijuana smoking at school, the meeting of my best friends, my first trip of LSD in my friend's house. I hope you understand. As the seconds pass on, heaven grants me the ability to achieve my dreams. For example, to the seventh second, I heard the voice of Emma Watson, who said, Where is he? And then, oh my god, I actually saw Emma Watson, as in one of my most beautiful dreams. She wore this beautiful white dress, her pretty face looking at me. I took her hand and this time she said, It's only the beginning. And then she disappears with a demonic face. Trust me or not, this is some holy shit. I don't know, it's very strange. In fact, I'm now at a funeral. At that time, I was in my coffin. I could not move or speak. During the last three seconds, this is what I saw. Third second. I heard a crowd cheering, saying it was a beautiful boy. Very sweet, why has he done this? The second second. I see my love. She is sad and puts a rose on my coffin. Someone is next to her. That person holds her in his arms. Then, she disappears. The very last second. I hear my father, and then my mother saying, Please, do not do that. My dad came up to me angry and said, Yes, you are a fucking shit. And smashes me with his foot. Black hole. My mind now no longer exists, and I'm back in the real world. A doctor comes up to me and says, So, it was you who ordered a lifetime trip. It will not hurt. I really feel that he's injecting me with what I think. A lifetime trip. But the doctor actually just comes to check my blood pressure. Boom. The trip starts to become even more intense. The whole room begins to warp and move, and the hallucinations are so strong that I fainted. I have no notion of time right now. Everything is black in my head. But I do not care, I just must be dead anyway. In fact, the feeling of death is not so bad. And here I have some auditory hallucinations that are that big that, that they feel like real voices. I don't know, I can hear some words such as blood pressure, heartbeat, too strong, lose him, injection, cardiograms, constriction, seizures. I heard this fucking crazy scary voice of the mad guys from Who Framed Roger Rabbit saying, You're fucking dead. Yes, you are. I do not know what time it is, but I found myself in a padded room. I was tripping again, but not more aggressive than before. I was lying on a bed. In the room I can see the words, LSD, beyond reality, moving on the wall. I stayed two days in hospital under advanced supervision. After this fucking huge trip, I slept for a long time, with fears and trembling. When I looked at my phone, the guy who sold me LSD claims it was Bromo Dragonfly and said if I was okay, etc. Now, this bastard is probably in jail, because my parents bring me to the police station and the cops take my phone. In conclusion, Bromo Dragonfly is an enormously hallucinogenic drug, very powerful and very dangerous. Doctors have told me they have failed to lose me more than three times. My heart stopped for a few seconds. The dose on the blotters were too high. I nearly died from Bromo, I'd like mild hallucinations for about one week after the trip as well. Plus I suffer from necrosis on my left feet, but now it's okay. Here is what I have had, or had. Necrosis, latent psychosis, chronic paranoia, heart problem, sometimes I had a peak beat, and split personality. So please be extremely careful with Bromo Dragonfly. And also, thank you for listening to me 
and sorry for my bad English. I tried to be as realistic as possible to describe my trip. But trust me or not, Bromo Dragonfly is a total mindfuck. Peace out. Three days of insanity under Chiris Dramonium. Cussed as the Shroomery Forums 14 years and two months ago. Alright, this is my first trip report I've ever done. So I'm going to tell you about my weirdest and probably dumbest trip ever. And by dumb, I mean I was younger and way stupider. And I did this without doing any research into what Deterra even was. Now I'm a bit smarter and will never in hell eat this stuff again. It really is called the devil's weed for a reason. A bit of background on myself. I have always been fascinated with nature and natural psychoactives, and at the time of this trip, I was in grade 10. I smoked weed every day, as often as three to four times a day, and was about five foot eight, weighing about 120 pounds. I was pretty average for my school, and at this point in my life, I had no experience of hallucinogens, only weed. My high school has always been very well known around my area for cannabis. I live outside Toronto, Ontario, in a small town, and my school has a reputation for having a lot of weed. Ask a Stoney, you know, in Toronto, and the town they think of first is probably my town. Anyways, I started hearing things at my school about this plant growing in people's gardens. And if you mix its dried leaves into joints, you got way, way higher. Next, I heard people were eating its seeds and actually hallucinating. So, of course, I had to try this shit out. I talked my friend C into giving me a location of one plant. And at lunch, me and three friends, B, D and T, snuck over and filled out bags of the spiky Datura seed pods. Before I went home to try them, I asked B how much I should take, trusting his experience with drugs, and he suggested 30 to 50 seeds to start, and work my way up from there, which was probably good advice. That night, I ate them. Bear in mind, I was a big pothead, and maybe a little naturally stupid, and I had no clue that you had to wait longer for orally ingested drugs to kick in. At 10pm, I started with 50 seeds. I chewed them up good and swallowed them. I waited around 15 minutes, I know, dumb, and figured they weren't working on me. At 10.15pm, I ate another 50 seeds, chewed them, and swallowed them. At 10.45, there was still no effects. I know, I'll just eat another 50 seeds, I thought. At 11pm, I now have 150 seeds in me. It's been one hour since I ate the first 50 seeds, and still no effects yet, so I figured this stuff might just be crap. These stupid lies at my school must have just been trying to get my attention, so I decided to smoke some weed and get to sleep. I figured I'd wasted my time. It was halfway through the night that I wake up and my hand is on my face. For some reason, the first thing to come to my mind is that I have a scorpion. I don't move. I don't want to get stung. Then I swipe off my face and realise that it was my hand. This whole thing didn't even strike me as unusual and I just returned back to sleep. 7.30am Tuesday morning. I wake up for school, but something is definitely not right here. My room is kind of moving in a way it didn't before, and my coordination is all wrong. I stumble over to my door and the laundry room to get dressed, when I think I see my dad standing there watching me. I've never quite got along with my dad, as he doesn't like my affinity for psychedelics. He just stands there staring. 
I ask him what is wrong with you. I'm trying to get dressed here. Wait. Where, where did he go? I go downstairs and I start eating breakfast. I find that my dad left for work two hours earlier. I'm confused, but then it suddenly dawns on me. Maybe this Tachira stuff isn't bullshit after all. I then went to school and really started my nightmare trip. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad in the right environment. But high school was definitely not the time or place for this particular trip. I talked to my friend C, who decides that he should tell me how long it lasts. Yeah, dude, this stuff lasts for three days at least. What the fuck? He tells me to have a good trip, good luck, and then leaves for class. Fuck me. Now I'm worried. The rest is fragments of my memory, but I will share the ones I remember here, as I remember them. On day one, things went reasonably well. Nobody seemed too suspicious, other than D and other friends who were telling me my pupils were massive. I remember hearing the odd voice in my head, some paranoia and crazy shit like that, as well as a wicked bad cotton mouth. Day one went relatively well. Not too many big hallucinations that I remember. Mostly these tracer type things, I think. At this point, none of my stoner friends, B, D and T, had actually eaten any seeds. Things are trippy, but not really in a bad way. And not like any drug I've done since then. So on day two, this is when shit hits the fan. I had constant cotton mouth and voices in my head. There were objects that shouldn't move and sometimes seemed to be doing so. But it wasn't in a cool way anymore. My girlfriend read upon the Jura and was worried about me. I'm trying hard to maintain my sanity during classes, which is getting tough now. I never noticed how much my science teacher looks like an orangutan, and I almost laugh in her face. Then I remember talking to my history teacher, and my foot starts to melt into the floor for a second. She must have noticed this, because she asked if I'm feeling okay, and looked into my eyes suspiciously. My eyes are like these huge black holes at this point. I'm constantly thirsty, dizzy, and have this pounding headache. My friends all want to eat some, despite all my warnings. But who gives a shit right now? I'm just focused on appearing sober. and doing a shitty job at it, to tell you the truth. That night I go home and sit on the couch. I just stare for a while. Not at the TV. In fact, I don't even think it even occurred to me. I was just staring into space. I remember feeling like my brain was full of static. It was then that my mum comes home and asks if I'm okay. For some reason, I comment on how foggy it is outside. She tells me that there is no fog, and that it's sunny. I decided this was a good time to take a walk down to where I work down the street. I was going to ask my boss for some time off the next week for this camping trip. Now here comes the craziest hallucination I think I have ever had. Since this, I have tripped on mushrooms once, MDMA three times, mescaline five, LSA 15 plus times, and salvia a dozen of times. As well, as a pretty large bunch of other things that I don't really want to get into now. But I still think this was one of my weirdest hallucinations to date. Excluding salvia, nothing gets weirder than that. So I was walking down my street, and I walked past a mini mall. I looked to the left at my reflection in a dark window, and thought that I saw me walking, holding hand with my girlfriend. The weird part was that I was so screwed up at this point, it didn't even click in that she wasn't actually there. Then, I looked back a second later, and I was now holding hands with myself. This clicked in as not right, and it scared the fucking piss out of me to be honest. I looked to my right, and sure enough, I was alone. 
I'm not exaggerating though. That was the realest hallucination that I've experienced. I cannot remember if I kept walking or just went home. By day three, things are getting nightmarish. I'm really looking forward to the end of this bullshit. Voices are coming and going more frequently than ever now, as well as trails and objects, and I'm starting to get pretty anxious and paranoid. I remember having a lot of trouble communicating with people, and even at one point, seriously considering that Dechura had made it possible for me to read people's minds. It was then that I was getting ridiculously delirious. Now, I'm not sure if this was a hallucination or not, but there was one moment in day three where I was seriously convinced that I might die. I was sitting in history class writing a test, which I failed obviously, when suddenly I felt this massive, massive pain in my chest. The pain was indeed real, but my brain may have made it seem worse at the time. This pain spread quickly to my left arm and back, and I was sure I was having a heart attack of some description. I freaked the fuck out and started sweating. Luckily, I sat in the back of the class, and soon I got through this whole ordeal without anyone noticing. I remember starting to get up to try and get some help, but the pain was so unbearable, I just had to stay sitting and squeeze my eyes shut. It was then that a couple minutes later, it was gone as quickly as it came. It was later on in that same class that we had a surprise fire alarm, where I met my friend D outside, who was also now under Dechura. He had no clue what was happening, and thought it was time to go home. I tried telling him we still had school, but he thought I was just lying to him. There was some more shit that went down, but this trip report is long enough already. I would seriously not recommend this. It totally sucked for the most part. I put three people in my school in emergency in less than a week. One of whom was in a coma, but thankfully recovered in the end. I'm just lucky that I wasn't one of them. <laughs>